The next reaction we're going to look at for aldehydes and ketones, and this is an aldehyde ketone specific reaction, is called the Wittig reaction. This was developed by George Wittig. He was a German chemist, um, and that's why it's pronounced with a V instead of a W. And what this reaction does is it uses these specialized phosphorus reagents, and this is actually called an illid. And we're going to look at its chemistry in just a bit. So an illid where we have a double bond between carbon and phosphorus, and that reacts with an aldehyde or ketone. And in terms of predicting the actual product, it's kind of simple. So what you can do is circle the oxygen and the triphenylphosphine. Those end up going together and bonding in a double bond. So the byproduct will be the oxygen double bonded to the triphenylphosphine. So let's highlight those two pieces. That oxygen, triphenylphosphine, those get double bonded together. This is triphenylphosphine oxide. And then the other product of the reaction will involve the carbonyl carbon and the illid carbon, one that's part of the double bond of the phosphorus. And those end up joining together to make a carbon-carbon double bond, or an alkene. So here is the six-membered ring that we have. There's that carbon in blue. That will get a double bond to the illid carbon that's also in blue. And that carbon has a three-carbon chain attached. So there's the product, an alkene. This is an easy way to predict the product of the reaction. If you're going to do it, just draw your aldehyde or ketone, then flip your illid such that the phosphorus and the oxygen are aligned and the carbon of the illid is pointing away from the ketone. And then you can circle those fragments to get the triphenylphosphine oxide and then the two carbons bond together to give you the alkene. The phosphorus-oxygen double bond is an extremely strong bond. And that's the driving force for the reaction. Otherwise, this reaction wouldn't necessarily make sense because you're going from a more stable carbonyl to a less stable alkene. But this drives the reaction to give this product. All right, so let's look at the mechanism um, because up here, this is just predicting the product. So how do these things actually react? The first thing you need to know to understand the mechanism is that the illid has two resonance structures. So let me just draw both illid resonance structures for you. And let's keep it simple. I'm going to do an R group. And here's the double bond to triphenylphosphine. Okay, phosphorus is kind of unusual, and this may seem a little counterintuitive, but what we can do here is take the pi electrons between the carbon and the phosphorus and push them onto the carbon such that you have a negative charge. So if we do that and draw the resonance structure, We get a lone pair and a negative charge on the carbon. That will leave a void on the phosphorus, so a positive charge there. It's possible to do the mechanism with either resonance structure, but I think this one is a little easier to see. So let's um, redraw our starting materials from this example. We have the cyclic ketone. All right, and then for the mechanism, here's my illid. I'm going to Flip it such that the triphenylphosphine is now on top. And the negatively charged carbon is down here on the bottom. And then there's three carbons attached. So this is the same structure as this up here, just a different resonance structure, and I flipped it over. Because for the mechanism, I want this carbon aligned with this carbon and the pho phosphorus and oxygen to be in alignment. So now what's going to happen I'm going to use the illid as a nucleophile, 
and draw a curved arrow from that lone pair to the carbonyl. And then I'm going to take these electrons and instead of just pushing them up onto the oxygen to form a negative charge, this is in close enough proximity to the positive phosphorus that what will happen instead is those electrons will come up here to the phosphorus and form a bond. So let's draw what we get. When I do that, the oxygen is now bonded to the P and it still has three phenyl groups on it. Then I have the carbon and that's bonded to the P. So you get this four membered ring and then attached we still have the three carbon chain. This particular structure here is called an oxophosphatane. It's this four membered ring where you have the phosphorus oxygen bond in that four membered ring. This isn't all that stable and what will happen from here is this will break down. We will use the sigma electrons in the ring and what I'm going to do is draw one curved arrow to show breaking this carbon oxygen bond to form the PO double bond and then a second curved arrow to show breaking the carbon phosphorus bond to form the carbon carbon double bond. And this will give me the alkene plus the triphenylphosphine oxide. When doing this, I often recommend you count the atoms, especially on the illid, to make sure you don't lose any. So let's do that. I'm just going to put an orange dot on the nucleophilic carbon here and make that one, two, three, and four. In our intermediate, we still have that carbon, one, two, three, and four. In the product, there's that same carbon, one, two, three, and four. That just assures we don't lose any carbons or add any unnecessary carbons.